Hi there Momentum owners. Today in our 2019 Grand Design Momentum, we're going to be taking a look at and showing you how to install Kodiak's disc brake system. We've got our customer Mark here. So Mark, we're just getting an idea of what, what was your thought process and why you decided on switching to electric over hydraulic disc so brakes. So this is a Grand Design Momentum 399. The GVWR is 20,000 pounds. The dry weight is 16,000 pounds and we roll at about just under 18,000 pounds. On two occasions, the light turns from yellow to red and there's a car sitting up there and we have needed to stop. And in both occasions, we, we got there in time, but I thought, geez, that was pretty close. And our trailer gain is set to pretty high with our F450 that pulls this. And so these hydraulic brakes are gonna stop now. Uh, so I hear they're gonna stop as good as the tow vehicle. Oh yeah. So I'm pretty excited about that. You, you just wait, when we get it all hooked up yeah. here with the same settings yeah. you have in your brake control, you're like, oh man, it's, yeah. it's too much brakes. And then secondly, with the uh, oil over the grease and just the way they look, I mean, it just feels like this is the proper setup for a, a rig this size. Uh, the other thing I'll add is we move from the half inch stud to the 916 stud, so mm -hmm. I just feel like that's a more robust stud for what's going on here. Oh yeah, the whole system now is way heavier duty than it was before. Yeah. All right, now I'm gonna just apply the brakes hard to tell when you just push the brake pedal because it stops as it should, right? But when you when you use the brake controller without the foot pedal, it's fairly profound. How how is your brake controller settings comparing now to where? Well, I'm in a five, and previously I was like seven to an eight. Okay, so uh, it's but quite a bit. yeah, it's quite a bit. But I don't know if my seven to eight was. All right, now I'm going to go into a stop just with the brake controller. Dude, that's crazy. Yeah. That was no foot pedal. <laughs> <laughs> that's that's crazy. Let's keep doing that, because that's fun. <laughs> yeah, what I really like about the brake controller is it's smooth now. Before, the electric brakes were jerky. That's the uh, portioning valve that's internal in there to ensure the brakes are all being applied evenly. Gotcha. One applying before the other yeah, look at this. Works. It's like I'm stopping without any, any trailer behind me. All right, so now we're gonna get up to 20 miles per hour now that we have a little bit of room, and I'm gonna just stop right, real quick. Oh yeah. Isn't that crazy? It, didn't, it, doesn't feel like it doesn't feel like you have anything back there at all. And what I was going to say is that when you have the electric brakes, you know, it can stop quickly, but it doesn't stop as smooth. And if a light were to change or you're going to be in an emergency situation and you had to stop quick, in those situations, you really question if you have enough power. They come as a quantity of two, so you'll get one for your passenger side and your driver's side. Now, since our momentum has three axles, you will need to pick up another two sets to complete the installation on your momentum. Many people are switching over to disc brakes because you get so much more braking power due to the increased surface area that you have on your brake pads to the rotor contact. On your drum brake, they have shoes that ride on the insides of the drum and the entirety of the shoe doesn't really contact the outer edge of the drum there. Only portions of it will contact it and as they are applied harder, more and more contact occurs. With our disc brakes here though, we've got that maximum amount of contact all the time and it adjusts how hard they brake based on the amount of hydraulic pressure that goes to your caliper. So what this means for you is that you can decrease the stopping distance that your trailer has. So you won't feel all of that weight pushing on the back of your vehicle. Now some of your vehicles out there are robust enough to be able to pull a trailer like this with the electric brakes, but your brake controller is going to be turned up pretty high in order for it to apply the right amount of pressure to stop your trailer. With hydraulic brakes, you're going to notice that you're going to be able to turn that brake controller way down and on those lighter vehicles where we were having trouble stopping because of the weight of the trailer pushing you, you're going to be more capable and feel safer going down the road. This is going to result in a more enjoyable trip for you and your family because you're not going to be white knuckled, unsure if you're going to be able to come to that stop ahead of you. And in the event of a panic stop, having the extra stopping power here could be the difference between having a close call or a costly repair. Now I've got some technical details for you so you can ensure that this is going to fit properly on your trailer. The rotor is a 13 inch diameter with 9 16 studs. And that's pretty important to remember because on your momentum you likely have different size studs so you're probably going to need to get new lug nuts to match your rotor. They're designed to work with an 8 on 6 and a half inch wheel and the wheel must be at least a 16 inch wheel or larger. And this is so it can clear the outside and not rub on your caliper. The system is designed to work with 7,000 pound axles, and this includes everything you'll see here for both your driver and passenger side. So you'll have your rotor, your disc brake pads, which are ceramic, a cast iron caliper, and what's nice about this caliper is that it has a low friction piston 
so the piston will retract farther than other calipers, reducing the amount of brake pad wear and drag when going down the road. You'll also get a cast iron bracket to get your caliper mounted up behind your rotor assembly. In addition to the stopping power you get with disc brakes, one of my favorite things about it is the maintenance. It's so much easier to just loosen up two bolts, take your caliper off, slap new pads on there, and you're back on the road. With a drum brake system, you have to pull the whole hub off just to get to your shoes to replace those. Now some do offer slots in the back where you can adjust those, but drum brakes are often going out of adjustment, and sometimes you just can't get to it with that little slot. It just depends on the tool that you have available. To get your drum hub assembly off, you have to remove the bearings, and it's just a big mess. With this, it's so clean and easy, you don't ever have to mess with any of that. In addition to our rotor assemblies here, we are going to need some additional parts. You're going to need a disc brake actuator. This hydraulic actuator needs to be rated for at least 1500 PSI. We're using one from Hydrostar that's rated for 1600 PSI. And then you're going to need all of your brake lines from your actuator to all of your calipers. You can get either metal lines here at eTrailer.com or you can opt for flexible lines like we're going to be installing on this system today. And lastly, you are going to need the bearings and seal for your rotor assembly. It does come with the races pre-installed, but you do need to purchase bearings. Now that we've gone over some of the features, let's do the installation together so you can have the confidence to do it at home. We'll begin our installation by removing the wheels from each of our axles. You'll want to lift your vehicle up so the tires are off the ground so you can do so. You can use your leveling jacks to lift it up. And once you've got it up, I highly recommend that you put some jack stands underneath your frame to support it because you don't want to trust just your hydraulic jacks while you're working on your vehicle. We'll remove the lug nuts using a three-quarter inch socket. You can then lift your wheel off and set it aside. We can then remove our center cap so we can access the nut holding our hub on. You can use a rubber mallet to tap that off. Sometimes they're a little bit uh, stiff on there. And if that's the case, you can use a screwdriver on the inner lip and just work your way around. We'll then remove our retaining washer. That just pulls right off of there. And then we'll remove the nut on the inside. It's not very tight, so you can take it off with a pair of pliers. You can also do all this by hand, but it is a bit messy. We can now pull our hub assembly off. Your outer bearing and washer is just gonna wanna fall out of there. So I like to use a screwdriver to help try and catch it. And again, it's, it is a messy job, so this also helps you stay a little clean. Once you've got your outer bearing off and your washer set aside your hub, and we now have access to our spindle and our electric brake assembly. We're gonna be removing this assembly to install our new disc brake system. There are five nuts holding on your electric brake assembly. We'll remove each of those nuts using a 916 socket. You may need an extension or a swivel in order to get on there. We can now go ahead and cut the wiring that goes to our electric brakes. And then we can slide the entire assembly off. Now since your Momentum fifth wheel toy hauler has three axles, you'll repeat the same process on the remaining five wheels to get all those assemblies removed. Now with all of our assemblies removed, we need to get all the grease off of here, clean it all up. We're gonna be using an oil bath setup with ours and you can't mix that oil with the grease. And really, even if you were just gonna be using a grease setup, you would still wanna get that all off of there because if you can't verify the type of grease that you had on there to begin with, if you were to mix it with an improper type the properties that the grease has for lubricating your bearings could break down, so it's best to just start fresh. And a good chemical to help break down the grease to get it nice and clean is a little bit of brake clean. And we're now gonna get all six of these spindles nice and clean. We can now take our new disc brake assembly here and we're gonna do a little bit of pre-assembly to make it fit onto our spindle properly. We'll have to put our bearings in. We need to do the inner bearing first. So this is the back side of our rotor. Your front side's gonna have your wheel stud sticking out of it. And it just drops down in there, but I do recommend you put a little bit of oil on it. Now, if you weren't doing the oil bath setup like we are, you would be using grease and you need to pack the grease down into the bearings. They have a 
grease packing tools that you can just drop down in and it packs it nice and quick and it's a lot less mess. But if you don't have one of those, you can just put a glob of grease in your hand and just smash it down in there, kind of spinning it, working the grease up in there. Since we're doing the oil bath, all we really need to do is just put a little bit of oil on there. We just want to prevent having dry bearings when we first start it. So just a little bit in there. Just kind of work your bearing around. Get that in there. And then it just drops right down in the race there. And we can install our oil seal in the back side. This does only go in one way. If you look on the inside here, it kind of is indented where it goes in and you'll have like a little spring that wraps around the inside. The spring always go on the inside. This bearing is a little bit thicker and more robust since it's the oil bath seal. If you had the grease seal it would have a similar look but it wouldn't be quite as heavy, wouldn't feel as thick. They're a little bit thinner uh, but they usually almost always have that spring which indicates that's the inside. Now our disc brake assembly here doesn't come with the bearings or the seal. It does have the races pre-installed in it, which is really nice because that's kind of a difficult task to do, especially if you don't have the proper tools. And they do it this way, so you have the option of choosing your oil bath seal or your grease seal. So you can use whichever one best suits your needs. You'll just set your seal in with that spring facing towards the inside, and then you're gonna drive it in until it's flush. You can pick up some seal drivers here at eTrailer.com, which is going to match the diameter of this to drive it in. But if you don't have any seal drivers, you can actually just use a piece of wood. We're just going to set that on there so that way we knock it down evenly. And you do kind of got to work it back and forth a little bit. But the goal is to go in as straight as possible. And we're just kind of now, now that we're almost all the way in, we're just going around the outside making sure that it's completely flush all the way around. In addition to cleaning off your spindle, you'll also want to clean off your washer, your nut, and your retaining clip because we're going to be reusing those. Now before we can slide our rotor onto our spindle again, we need to install our bracket. If you have less than 8,000 pound axles, we're going to be putting it in the rearward position. So if you're on the right side, that's going to be 9 o'clock. On the driver's side, that's going to be 3 o'clock. If you have over 8,000 pounds, you would clock it at the 12 o'clock position on both sides. For our application here, we're going to be having it facing towards the rear. We'll then reuse the hardware for your electric brake assembly to keep our bracket tightened down. And then tighten those down with your 916 socket. It's not a bad idea to do it in a star pattern just like you would a wheel to make sure it's drawn in evenly. We can now lift our rotor assembly over our spindle, being careful not to nick the seal as we get it all the way down. Once you've got the seal on there, we can take our outer bearing. It's a good idea to pre-lubricate this as well by just squirting a little bit of the oil in it like we did before or pack it if you're doing the grease version. Slide your bearing in. Place the washer on it and then thread your nut on. We can now tighten that down. And I like to spin the rotor as I do that to make sure that it's going all the way on nice and even and to make sure that it gets fully seated onto the spindle. And you should feel it get tighter when you try to spin the rotor once you've got it all the way down. We don't wanna leave it this way all the way tight, but this way we can be sure that we have got it all the way seated up on there. We can then back it off and we wait till it's loose and then we're just gonna snug it back up just, just a little bit until we feel a little resistance there and then we're gonna check for play. You'll wanna shake it top to bottom and feel it for play there. I can feel there's a little bit of play. To make it easier, if you're having a difficult time doing this, you could put your wheel on there and put a couple lug nuts on it. You'll get more leverage. Make sure you take your center cap out because that's gonna prevent you from being able to tighten this down. We could use just a hair more to snug ours up. 
check. Feels pretty good. So now we'll take our retaining clip. We want that to line up with the flat side there and slip on. If it slips right on, you're good to go. If it doesn't slip on, then you may need to tighten it up just a little bit until the notches line up with the hex so that way it slides on. Take your cap, put a little bit of oil around the seal to help prevent it from nicking and to go in properly. And then just thread it on the outside here. Now there is a torque spec written here on the front of your cap. It does use a very large socket, so, so there's a high likelihood that you won't have this socket. So really, as long as you get it tight to where it's fully seated up against here, you should be good. You're better off not over tightening it. So if it's a little bit loose, you can always go back to check to see if you've got any of the oil leaking out and then just snug it up a little more because if you over tighten it, you're gonna crack it and then you're gonna need a new one and you're gonna be out of service until that new one comes in. We're now gonna fill it up with 80, 90 weight oil. You can pick this up at your local automotive store. And when you're adding the oil to it, it's not a bad idea to spin the assembly. This helps it work into the bearings and into the cavities inside your rotor. Pause for a second. Once you filled it up to the line here and when it starts to run back out, then you're completely full. Again, I like to rotate it a few times just to make sure that oil's gotten into all the bearings and cavities. Then give it a second to let it sit because if you do that, you might see that the oil level drops down a little bit. You might need just a little bit more. And then we can reinsert our cap our assembly is now full of oil and we can put our caliper on. We've now got our caliper assembly. Make sure your inner brake pad is pushed all the way in. And then to help it fit a little easier, there's some slide pins here. If you push those so they're out towards the inner side of your caliper there, it will make it a little easier to slide on. It's a pretty snug fit sliding through those pieces there. So you got to make sure you got it lined up on an even plane so it slides on there. We're gonna put some white lithium grease on our guide pins. If you need some white lithium, you can pick some up here at eTrailer.com. And this will thread right into the caliper bracket. It is gonna be a little snug getting it in there due to the sealant on the end of our bolt. That makes it a little hard to tighten my hand, as well as the paint that they put on the uh, brackets. Now due to the location of your leaf spring, you may not be able to slide the bolt in while the caliper is already in position. So you may need to put your bolt through, then slide it into place in order for it to clear. We can then go back and tighten those down with a half inch wrench. We can then go back and torque our hardware to the specifications found in our instructions. For your top bolt, you may need to use a crow's foot to gain access to it to torque it down. Now, if you don't have a crow's foot, you wanna make sure you get this bolt tight. You can torque the bottom bolt, then slide your wrench on there, feel how tight you've got that one, and then just mimic that tightness here on the top bolt. Now that we've got this one completely installed and torqued down, we can repeat this same process for the remaining five wheels. Once you've got all of your disc brake assemblies installed, you can move on to installing the actuator towards the front and routing all the lines from your actuator back to your brake calipers. Once you've got your brake lines and your actuator installed, you'll need to bleed the brakes. The way you do this is by loosening the highest bleeder screw in your caliper. Your calipers do have two bleeder screws, but you wanna use the one that's the highest on there. You can use a 7 16 wrench to hold the nut for the bleeder screw and a 5 16 wrench to open the bleeder screw. Now I recommend having two people when bleeding your brakes. You'll need one person back here at the brake caliper to crack the bleeder screw loose and to catch the fluid and then somebody up at the front to pull the pin on the breakaway switch or to activate the brake controller to get the actuator pumping the fluid. To help minimize a mess I'm using a water bottle. You just cut a hole in the top for a cap and then a rubber hose and I slid the rubber hose over our bleeder screw. This makes it easier to see if you have any bubbles shooting out. And it also just again helps keep it clean. So we're gonna go ahead and pull the pin one more time and you'll see that it's gonna be nice and solid because we've got all the air out of the system. And this is what you wanna see. Go ahead and pull it. 
If there was the presence of bubbles down inside there, you would need to refill your reservoir and repeat the process until you got a nice solid stream like we've got here. Whenever you're refilling it, you want to make sure you're using new brake fluid. You don't want to use old used brake fluid. Now that we've got our system completely bled, we want to make sure that we don't have any leaks. Our actuators are very high output pressure and it just has the tendency for lines to leak at such a high pressure. So we're going to pull the pin now. We're going to go inspect all of our unions and make sure we have no fluid leaking out of any of them. You'll inspect the back of each of your calipers where it connects and any other union point such as your four-way, three-way, and two-way T's. With no leaks, we're ready to reinstall our wheels, hook up our trailer, and hit the road.